How's everybody doing today? Huh? Amen. This is a good place to be. I, I, uh, I look forward to every day in my life. I've got a good life, and uh, this is a good place to be. But, boy, Sunday morning, you just kind of just feel that extra, just want to dot every I and cross every T, and we don't want to miss God, and we don't want to be so scheduled in with what we're doing that maybe we miss something, but my goodness. Uh, this morning, I was praying in here, and I thought, what's God trying to tell me this morning? And he said, stop worrying about all the details. And it's easier said than done sometimes. Because just all that stuff keeps rolling. But I am anticipating the move of the Holy Spirit in this place. He already is moving. And you know what? We don't have to beg him. We don't have to beg God to show up. He's already here. We've got to beg ourselves to show up. Step into what God has already provided for us. You know, it really is that simple. It really is that simple. Now, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel or name it, claim it, and all that. I'm not talking about that. Why? Our minds usually go that way because we see the excesses. I'm talking about the relationship with God that he wants for every believer. to step into it. Amen. Some of the things that we agonize over the most are it's already done. Right. I think sometimes God looks and says, well, what do you want? You want an engraved invitation? I already signed one in blood 2,000 years ago. What are you waiting for? I think about weird things sometimes, and, and uh, I know that surprises you. And nobody else here has that problem at all, but you know, we're in week eight of this whole taking a look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And the reason we're going so slow is because I want to try to examine different facets of this that maybe sometimes we skip over. I think sometimes we talk about spiritual gifts and we talk about the uh, special abilities, that's the way the New Living Translation says it, the special abilities the Lord gives us. And we either don't want to ask questions about it or we have right off the bat decided, oh, this, I can tune out, this isn't for me. And I don't want anybody to do either of those things. I look at sometimes scripture and and I ask some questions. Um, You've ever thought of something like, when was the first transatlantic flight? Well, you'd go on Google and you can find it. I don't remember the date, but I know if I went to Google, I could find it. What does this word mean? What's the root of this? And all these things we think of. Every so often, something will come to me, and maybe I'm just that weird. And I'll try Google search, and there's nothing. Like, why is this called a service? We just sit. I mean, we do a little bit more than sit. Why do they call it a church service? And why do people call and say, what time are your services on Sunday morning? Google doesn't know. The closest thing I found is it goes back to when they would have every service there would be communion or the Eucharist, right? Holy, Holy Communion, and that would be served. But I think most people that go to a service don't serve a whole lot. So then I, I got to thinking about some other things. I think, you know, here's this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And we know from the very beginning that it was in response to another letter, right? I'd love to see that other letter, wouldn't you? I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily, it wouldn't be Scripture, right? But it would be a letter, it says, from Chloe, and the household of Chloe. So, I actually did some digging and I found it. Yeah, found it. You didn't didn't know it was available, did you? Okay, well, here, here we go. The date is 55 years since Jesus. It's written to Paul of Tarsus in Ephesus. It's from Chloe's household in Corinth. Dearest Paul, 
Greetings in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who has delivered us from the corruption of this world and given us freedom from sin and hope through the Holy Spirit. We are so grateful that you established this church several years ago on your first trip to Achaia and have learned that you are preparing to return to Jerusalem. We pray for safety in your travels and kingdom favor to you as you preach the good news of Christ. And then they, they add a few other things. We'll skip ahead. They talk about some divisions and some preacher fan clubs and sexual immorality with lawsuits and husbands and wives fighting and meat sacrifice to idols, attitudes, and oh, here we go, spiritual gifts. Some of us are a bit concerned about what is happening during our meetings here. While we are excited about the special abilities God gives us and have been amazed at the spectacular miracles occurring as we gather to worship, we have some questions about two of the Holy Spirit's gifts in particular, speaking in unknown tongues and prophesying. We know that it is only the Spirit's enabling that makes these marvelous utterances possible, but can you provide some guidance on their proper use and application in our meetings? Uh, Joseph and Saul, who came to us from the synagogue after believing in Jesus, spend a lot of time prophesying, and they don't really give others an opportunity to share. We love them, but it seems like they are dominating our meetings. Also, Lucas and Alexander, formerly from the Temple of Aphrodite, have been marvelously saved and speak in unknown tongues more than their native Greek. We love their freedom and worship when we gather together, but they often continue on and on with no time given for the Spirit's interpretation. Perhaps you could advise us on the proper use of this supernatural gift. They go on. We, we really hate to mention this because I don't, don't want to cast dispersions on a whole group of people, but many times some of the women here interrupt the moving of the Holy Spirit to ask questions which could be better answered apart from our meetings. I mean, they mean well, but after all, they're unlearned <laughs> and could benefit from some private education about spiritual things. Maybe even their husbands could help them with this at home. Is that a reasonable request? Above all, we want to preserve the sacredness of God's church and remain humble under the authority of our Lord. We value the supernatural gifts that God has made possible for us to walk in as we seek and serve Him. And then they go on and questions about some group is trying to come in, water down Paul's message on the uh, resurrection and our glorified bodies. And they say, you know, say hi to Timothy and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos and all of that. And of course, you know that I made that up. But I think it illustrates some of the things that were going on and why Paul wrote this letter in the first place. As a church, we have doctrine and we have points, you know, with the assemblies of God, the 16 fundamental truths, uh, which are, are some, it's not, it doesn't cover everything, but it's foundational. And, and so a bunch of people through the years sat down and wrote these things down. And, and that's what our doctrine is. Well, Paul didn't write this letter in that attitude, but more in answering the questions and correcting some misuse of spiritual things. And that's why the, the subject or the title of this message is Spiritual Things in Church. Because sometimes, because we walk in flesh, we don't always get it right, do we? We, we don't always get it right. I don't always get it right. Pastor Dan doesn't always get it right. Those who are involved in ministry don't always get it right. So we do extend a little bit of grace. But in response to this letter from Chloe's household that, that Paul received, we can take that example and say, well, what can we learn from this about these things? And especially when it comes to things like speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about these things, not just in 1 Corinthians 4, 12 through 14. So, I think it's good that we take a look today at the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I gotta, I'm going to just warn you, there's a lot of Scripture here, but how many can handle here the Word of God today? Huh? I mean, I wouldn't want to bore you or anything with the Word of God. But I just want to let you know, there's going to be a little bit more than, than maybe, uh, you know, what we might have. More of a Bible study, perhaps. 
But I think it would be a good thing to understand these things because there's plenty of gossip that goes around. Except in the church, we just call it sharing. But there's plenty of, that was a joke, plenty of gossip that goes around about things when you could really find out the answer if, if you wanted to. We have the answer if, if you want to, right? I, it breaks my heart when I hear people who have been in church all their lives when it comes to these kind of subjects, baptism in the Holy Spirit, tongues, prophecy, healing, and all that kind of stuff. People that have been in church all their lives that have their own preconceived ideas of what they think apart from the Bible, and they'd rather believe that than believe this. So we don't want that to happen. So we're going to confine our discussion today to 1 Corinthians 14. One exception. I'll have a verse I'll throw in a little bit later about that. But really it's to establish some facts and ground rules. And we know, I already told you some of the background of Corinth. There was a mixture of people, young Christians, many of them coming from a pagan lifestyle, totally different than anything that we would have grown up with in the church. They knew nothing about Abraham or uh, the, the uh, patriarchs. Moses, Elijah, meant nothing to them. They were starting from scratch. So rather than trying to get them to be Jewish first, or although some people tried to do that, Paul is coming and saying, let me just tell you about Jesus and tell you about So they're getting set free. Uh, they're being born again, and the Holy Spirit is infilling them, and they are hungry. They're coming after God, and God is just downloading more and more of His blessing into them. So this is a church that was very active in the manifestation gifts of the Spirit. They, they had no problem with that. Their problem was their level of maturity to make sure they were doing it in the right way. We walk around a combination. We're spirit way inside, right? But we walk around in flesh. And sometimes the flesh and, and the, the soulish part of our mind, you know, that doesn't necessarily change. So we're, we're working and we're moving in spiritual things, but yet we have to constantly be on guard about maybe claiming some of those gifts or maybe getting into the flesh and getting proud about that. Paul is reminding the church in Corinth, and I want to remind us all today, that when we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we do it as a body of Christ. We do it for the benefit of all. It's not so somebody can have a plaque to put on their wall about uh, this gift or that gift or this ability or that ability. Uh, it's all about love. So, uh, something to understand, and, I, and I'm going to mention this a couple times. When you go through this, you've got to understand the context that it is in. Majority of what Paul is writing about in chapter 14 is what happens in public meetings when we come together to worship, so we can apply it to us today. Some things are to be carried over regardless of the uh, context that they're in. Let me, let me just give you a little bit of an example. We could, we could have a policy uh, against playing tackle football in the sanctuary, which probably would be a good idea, but it wouldn't stop us from having a game out here. Right? We could have a policy against firing up a barbecue in here, but like we did last week, more than welcome to do it out under the pavilion. Right. We can't take one thing and also make it blanket for every church. So we're going to cover some of this. This is a, a sticking point for people who are going out of their way to uh, have a cessationist mindset. And, and so you need to understand that when Paul's writing these details, it's about the proper operation and use of these gifts when we gather together. And that's a big, uh, big distinction. A good example, too, in verse 34, we talk about women being silent in the church. We have to understand what that meant. Also, order of worship, verse 26, where he says about let there be this, 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 and this. We can't take that to be well, okay, here's our order of worship. No, it's representational, right? So we have to get make sure we're getting to the foundations. There's particular instruction. Uh, that would be uh, women being silent in the church in Corinth. 
and also uh, the order of worship, the suggested order of worship. Why was it particular to there? Well, women were mo mainly unlearned in that culture, right? And apparently, we can judge rightly, understanding that a letter came, we can understand that there had to be some disruption or else he would not have addressed it. So we can imagine, uh, let's say uh, kids are in worship and you're trying to do some deep truths and they keep interrupting and asking questions in public. I believe we're best to understand it that way. So it's like, look, there's a time and a place for this. Why don't you, not in the middle of worship, let's get these, let's educate off to the side. It's a little different today. We can't take that and say women should be silent in the church. And the New Testament, for that matter, reinforces the fact that women prophesy. We'll get into that a little bit later. The other thing is the order. It's obvious by reading the response to this letter, they had an issue with tongues, that it was taking too much of the service. And the service, there, I did it. The meeting, too much of their meeting. And it was, it was not benefiting anybody. So that's why Paul had to write these corrections. Now, other places, maybe there wouldn't be that big of a deal. But for this particular congregation at this time, those are things that were made in particular to this congregation. Other parts of this are general that can be applied everywhere. So let's get going on this before I run out of time. Let's look at verse 4. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Both of these things are revelatory. In other words, it's revelation from God. So, and they both involve speaking, right? So there's, there's some commonality, but they both have different applications. Prophecy appears in all three lists, if you will, of the spiritual gifts that we find in the New Testament. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. We see uh, in Ephesians 4 a prophet as uh, someone who might uh, like have a resident gift of prophecy, someone that we would expect to prophesy on a regular basis. Uh, the prophecy that's listed in these nine manifestation gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 is, is, is an ecstatic utterance, unrehearsed. God has, has downloaded this to me, and I feel I must share it. And so it's, it's a, a word from God in the known tongue of the people. Uh, both involve cooperation with the Holy Spirit, tongues and prophecy. Both of them, flesh can get in the way. I remember a church I was at one time when I was on the road of ministry, and I would always ask the pastor, what time are they usually used to getting out? And he said, when you're done, quit. I never forget it. Too many times, God's done, and the Holy Spirit's at the restaurant trying to get a table, and we're still going. And I think that probably is what was happening in Corinth. And that could happen with prophecy. Some people like a microphone. And that's, it's okay if they're immature or they're learning, right? The other thing is that tongues can get out of control, especially if there's no one to interpret. You can get into, into flesh on that too. You start to think, listen to me. Aren't I spiritual? Both the wrong attitude in public worship. We've got to understand the difference here between particular and general instruction. So, particular, I mentioned uh, the women, uh, uh, order of worship, and prophecy is superior to tongues in public worship unless interpreted. That's general. That can be applied everywhere. There is a superiority, of a, or maybe the best way to say it is a value. Prophecy is more highly valued in a public meeting. That's something we can apply no matter what. So let's go on here just a little bit. Prophecy is superior, I just mentioned verse five. Uh, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you're saying so that the whole church can be strengthened. This is not talking about private tongues. This is one of the arguments that people will make. See, uh, I wish that you all, right, uh, could speak in tongues. And we're talking about public 
meetings. And if someone is remaining unconvinced that that is talking about public meetings, why would you prophesy in private? What use would it be? Why would you prophesy in private if no one is there to benefit? Amen. In the same term, he's not talking about a prayer language. He's not talking about private times where we, our spirit prays. Right. Not at all. Two weeks. In two weeks, we're going to do the whole message about speaking in tongues. The different uses, the different applications, and we want to get some correct information so that people don't go on saying stuff they don't, that's not grounded in the Word. I just give you a warning in case you don't want to hear that. You wouldn't have to be here, but I really hope you do come for that. Verse 18 and 19 says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, but in a church meeting, ah, see, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Amen. If we have a meeting and all we hear is people going on for hours speaking in tongues, well, they may be blessed by it, but how does it benefit anybody else? Paul says, <laughs> I speak in tongues more than any of you. But when we come together, I'd rather speak five words from God as a prophecy than 10,000 words in an unknown language. This is, uh, I believe, strikes to a problem they were ha having at this church. Nothing wrong with dancing in the spirit, jumping, and, and there I've been to churches that you got to look out, go get run over. <laughs> you know, and that's great. And we should be free in worship. But there are, there's orderly, an orderly nature to public worship. It can't just be all running around. We need to be taught. We need to, to pray. We need to have all these uh, different parts of our public meetings. If you're still unconvinced to anyone who may be of a critical spirit, if you're still unconvinced that he is not talking about private tongues, uh, I would ask you to make a note of the last time that you prophesied to nobody in private. Different uh, uses for the same gift. Prophecy. Let's look at what prophecy is. It's a foretelling of heavenly truth. The uh, a Greek lexicon defines it this way. A discourse emanating from divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted or revealing things hidden, especially by foretelling future events. It's God speaking to his church through the church. Huh? God speaking to his church through the church can easily be coupled with other gifts. Uh, tongues interpreted, interpreted is prophecy. God is speaking. God's uh, using people in prophecy is going to line up with His Word. And when someone gives a message of prophecy, uh, uh, a prophecy we should discern it. We should evaluate it. According to what? Our feelings? Our religion? No, according to the Word of God. And as I've been trying to say through this whole series, we don't cherry pick it, right? The whole counsel of the Word of God. Amen. So you could see that there can be tongues interpretation, it could be a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, prophecy, all kind of blending together. Let's not worry about what category to put it in. No? Let's move it from here to here. Let's just Believe God that, yes, he could use even little old me in these supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy and tongues are contrasted in uh, public worship. Let's look at verses 22, start at 22. 
Uh, so you see that speaking in tongues is a sign. Not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking an unknown language, they'll think that you're crazy. Now, when you first look at this, it looks contradictory, doesn't it? This is, this is a really troublesome passage in the Bible. And there's a lot of people that explain it different ways, but you've got to understand, first of all, and remember we're talking about a public meeting here. He says tongues is a sign to unbelievers that something beyond their comprehension is going on. It will get the attention of unbelievers. Prophecy, he says, is for the benefit of people who already believe so that they could be uh, matured and nurtured in the faith. But verse 23 starts off in this translation, even so. I guess it's important. It's a good translation, even so. In other words, that being said, or consequently. Now he's shifting just a little bit. If, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things, people who are not a, acquainted with deeper spiritual things, if they come in to your meeting and everyone, catch that word, and everyone is speaking in an unknown language, they'll think you're crazy. So for the benefit of an unknown tongue being properly used in a worship service with interpretation, that's a sign for unbelievers. But what, what Paul is saying by not saying it is the way you people are doing it is wrong because there's no edification for the body. And what are people going to think when they come in? You're just crazy. What's the purpose? And in that case, when they hear interpreted a, a, a tongue in a worship service, they're going to understand that, listen, something of God is going on here. Doesn't mean that tongues isn't a sign to unbelievers. It also doesn't mean that one person in giving a message in an unknown tongue with interpretation, it doesn't mean that that's not beneficial to an unbeliever. See, it's kind of both. The proper use is the best way to do it. The proper use is the best way to do it. And I believe there are times, and we do it here in, in public worship, where we just take a moment and say, let's just fill the room with, with praise. It's entirely appropriate yeah. to pray in tongues. Entirely appropriate to play and pray in tongues together. I love being in a room where people are just going after God. I love being in a room that's so loud, and, and some of it is English and some of it is not, and it's a marvelous sound, and I think it has its place in worship. But you don't have to do it into a microphone. You got me? Because when we do that, we're like showing off. I've got a real problem with that, and it's probably my problem. If you're going to do it, great. Put the mic down. Because really then, shouldn't we be waiting and do things decently and in order and wait for interpretation? Yeah. But my goodness, let's not get so hung up on this and say that we can't feel free to express that. Not at all. Amen. Paul gives further instruction that if you don't believe there is someone who, to interpret, then do it privately. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. I've been to churches of every stripe you can imagine. Every denomination, every uh, custom, every tradition. I guarantee you, I would have caused problems had I launched into a message in tongues. But that didn't stop me before the service from getting alone with God and praying in an unknown tongue. Who says that God can't interpret what you say in the privacy of your own home? Who says that when your spirit prays, you're, you're, you're praying heavenly secrets that you may not understand, but God does. Amen. That you are giving him permission to align us to what he wants. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Suggestions he has here for orderly worship. One sings. One teaches, one is used in revelatory gifts, one speaks in tongues, one interprets, 
and he has some advice. Let no more than two or three speak in tongues. That could be a different piece of advice for another congregation. Right? I don't know if I told this story. I'm coming up on five years here. Get used to it. But <laughs> out in North Dakota one time at a district campground, I was leading worship for the week. And uh, it's an old tabernacle. They've since rebuilt it, but old-fashioned tabernacle, really cool. Well, not cool, no air conditioning, but it was nice. And in the front, there were two sets of stairs, one on each side, and there was a, a wall so that you could stand in the stairwell and not be seen. And I was told by the district superintendent, you call the shots, you pick the songs, you have full, which meant I also had to deal with the people that would come up and say, hey, I think we should do this or we should do that. And I knew a lot of these people because I spent so much time in the AG churches in North Dakota that I knew about every pastor. So a lady came up to me after the service one night, after the meeting one night, and she said, uh, I have a... Uh, Chofar. And uh, I thought it would be cool. Maybe we could start the meeting with a shofar. The more I talk to this person, I, well, sometimes you just can get a, that she kind of liked the idea of being on stage. So I said, I have a good idea. Let's do that. And you can announce it from inside one of the stairs, and no one will know where it's coming from. And she didn't like that, <laughs> but she did it. So there was some guidance there that may not have been necessary in another situation. Same thing here. Let one or two, two or three, I'm sorry, speak and then move on. That was needed for this church. That's not an overall instruction for us. Although, if it got to be too much, well, then you may have to. You see what I mean? It's kind of like deacons. You know, there are some churches that think that you've got to have seven because there were seven in the book of Acts. Well, I think it was representative, right? So we're not, we're not making a hard and fast rule here, but we're speaking to order. This was specific to the church in Corinth in the mid-50s A.D. Verse 28 Though so he says, but if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. And that's good advice. Yes, right. So here's the other question, or here's the other point that so many will bring up, that the one who is speaking should know if there's someone there to interpret. And I think that's a faulty reading of this. I think that assumes too much. If we don't know what we're saying, right, right. how are you supposed to know? Right. Here's a good way to approach this. If you're around a group of people that this is not their experience, <coughs> that they are not used to this, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be quiet. Don't try to force something on people who are, I will not go out and start speaking in tongues next Sunday morning at the fairground. <laughs> not out loud anyway, because I understand that there's differing beliefs on that. Here's the other point that I've never heard anybody talk about. What about the one who is in the meeting, who God is giving the interpretation, and they don't speak? See? You can't lay it all at one person. The, the cessationists love this line. Yeah. Oh, no one, no one interpreted, so you must be wrong. Why? Why? He does say that let the one who is speaking pray that God will give them interpretation. And that happens sometimes, right? Sometimes it, it does not. So we've got to make sure that we're looking at, at this in a foundational way to understand so, let's look at this. Verses, uh, we'll start at 29. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. 
But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. I've never, I, I, there was a time I just did not understand this. Why should somebody stop to let somebody else, well, I believe it speaks to a particular problem. We call it grandstanding. Like, like God stopped speaking about two paragraphs back. But you see, we walk in flesh, and we're not always going to get it right. Right? We're not always going to get it right. This is not condemning, but he is giving wise advice from God himself. Listen, if someone's going on and on, how many remember uh, uh, Cliff Arquette? He, he was Charlie Weaver, and he wrote these books, and they were letters to Mama, and it was really funny stuff. My dad used to have an expression. He'd say, they're going on like Charlie Weaver's mother, which meant they don't know when to quit. And I believe we can safely take from this instruction that there were some who were grandstanding. Listen, they were immature. God was speaking through them, but maybe just get off into flesh a little bit. And the way to do that is if someone else has a word from God that the one who's speaking should yield. Pretty good advice. Particular advice. Not necessarily general. But it goes to the heart, doesn't it? It's all about love. Defer to one another. Yeah. Learn how to listen. Uh, let's look at the next one, starting at 34. Or, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed a couple. Yeah, remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. So now here is a general instruction. In all the meetings of God's holy people. Here's the foundational truth that is not particular to Corinth that we can look at today and say, absolutely, he's talking to us. Amen. People who prophesy are in control of their spirit. The tongue of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That's old King Jimmy. But God is not a God of disorder. There is order. There is a holy order. Let's respect one another. That is a general uh, piece of advice right there. So let's go on now. 34. Women, here we go. Women should be silent during the church meetings. <laughs> is it, it is not proper for them to speak. Too bad Melody's not in here. She's working in the nursery today. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. I think we really have to understand what it meant then. Because there is so much biblical evidence for women in ministry. There are those who will take this and apply it over every situation. We are best to understand it as what was causing the disorder. Something had to be causing the disorder or he never would have approached this. And in this particular instance, most women were unlearned in that day. They were not educated. This, and listen, everybody was learning. This was brand new to most of these people. Even those who grew up out of Judaism, this was a brand new way of thinking, right? Christ being the fulfillment of the law. We think about some of the other occasions in Scripture. Think about Aquila and Priscilla, the husband and wife ministry team, uh, mentioned uh, six times in Scripture, and three of those times... Um, her name comes first. We, we see that she was a great teacher. The two of them taught Apollos. Apollos was a great orator and understood things of God, but he didn't understand at all. Uh, the Bible says that he only knew of John's baptism. And who was it that w was going to teach him the way more completely? It was Priscilla and Aquila. Yeah, her name came first in Acts uh, where that is mentioned. Paul worked in ministry with them in Rome and in Corinth and in Ephesus. Uh, we have Philip, the, not the apostle, but the deacon. 
He had four daughters who, what did they do? They prophesied. They were used. Why would you prophesy at home? Right? They, they were being used to minister in the church. Uh, we have Lydia in Philippi, who was a founding member of that church, says that the church in Philippi met in her home. What role did she have? Many people think that she was fundamental in holding this group of praying women together down by the river because there weren't enough men to have the synagogue. So what role did Lydia have in the church in Philippi? Anna the prophetess in Luke 2. Anna the prophetess, what did she do? She prophesied in the temple day and night. Phoebe was called a deaconess by Paul himself in Romans 16. Many more, not to mention the, the Old Testament women in ministry. No, to, to, to disqualify women in general from this verse of Scripture is not fair. That's right. That we are neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Yes. Joel prophesied that in the last days your, your young uh, men and women would prophesy. Huh? Your sons and daughters. So let's not apply this... This, this particular instruction on a general basis. Are you still with me? Yeah. You still here? Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. But be sure that everything is done properly and in order. That right there you can apply everywhere. I do believe that the best way that we can summarize this issue of the importance of tongues, or if we have this gift, one gift versus another mentality, is what Paul himself said in verse 15. He said, well then, what should I do? I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit. And I will also sing in words that I understand. I want you to be hungry for all of it. I want you to walk in an expectation of all of it. One may never be used in a meeting like this, in a public message in tongues, One may never be used in giving a word of prophecy or a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. One may not have the gift of discerning between spirits, but you may. And and we've made way too much of these categories, if you ask me. We've made too much of these categories. We know that all born-again children of God have the Holy Spirit living within them. And because of the Holy Spirit indwelling them, they have the potential to be used in areas of service and gifting that are not natural to us. God can also take a natural talent that you have and, and have you use it for His honor and for His glory. Amen. But I still believe, and, and I believe the Bible is very clear, that there is a second work after salvation, that is an entrance into these manifestation spiritual gifts. Now, I got to be honest, some of that I don't understand. Someday I will. I have known people who do not claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I've seen God use them in these areas. I don't know how this is, but here, let's, let's take it from theology and doctrine to matters of the heart. Just seek Him with everything you have. And believe that there is more. There's always more. Please don't check off a box. Please don't. Whether it's your salvation and your relationship with Him, whether it's walking in deeper spiritual things, whether it's seeking the the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit or being used in these gifts, please don't check off a box. Please just put all that away and just come before Him and say, God, I just want everything you have for me. Please don't use the Word of God in a cherry-picking fashion 
to make it say what you want it to say and not to say. Let us come before the Holy Spirit of the living God who is present in this room right now to teach these things to us. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of trusting God. It's a matter of trusting God. I, I'm, I don't apologize for this. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Friends, you cannot make God do anything, right? I can't make God do anything. I can't make you do anything. But I can lead you into areas that God has already done something. We're not asking him to do anything that he's not already done. And that is he has made available for all of us a deeper life and experience than we're walking in now. Every single one of us. There are things that I know for as much as I know that my name is Tim uh, and that I'm in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. There are things that I know to be true that I've not yet been able to walk into, but I will. I know. I know that I know. And the, the, the thing that I do not want to see anyone come into after 40 years in ministry and many, many times at this end of a building preaching to people, don't stop. It's all by faith. It's all by trust.